Thank you, everyone. Good morning. Um, I'd really like to take just a moment to acknowledge uh, Beth Thielen. Uh, I know she's going to get a big thank you tomorrow, but Beth, uh, we've become good friends through our connection here at this conference, and uh, what you and Tony, your partners, Tony Steele, in this work, done has been remarkable, and I would feel remiss if I didn't take a moment just to acknowledge it, so thank you. And the good news, folks, is you're here. <laughs> you've given yourself the day, you got through the traffic, you found the place. You can relax. You've arrived. So I'm talking about meditation and personal kindness. And really, it's a pretty unveiled attempt to encourage you to meditate. So I'm just curious, how many of you have got a pretty much daily practice of meditation. Yep. So I want to just support you and that encourage you. And for those of you who aren't, uh, the whole idea of what I'm going to present is to give you some more encouragement. And perhaps the best way of all to do that is to have some personal experience. So can I suggest we might just take a few moments to uh, settle and really arrive more fully and what I'd like to suggest is if you've got anything on your lap, perhaps you just pop it on the floor for the moment so you won't be disturbed. And then it's good to just sit just as upright as your body's comfortable, perhaps your feet flat on the floor, a little apart. And perhaps with your hands just resting on your thighs or cupped in your lap, just notice what works best for you. Then you might like to lean back a little and Feel the support from the back of the chair. And then you might like to join me for a few moments and just let your eyes close gently. And do what you can to let go of whatever you've been involved with up to this time. Some of you have probably had a pretty busy few days or weeks, morning. I aim to just let go of all that, leave the past in the past. And do what you can to allow the future to unfold in its own time. And if there's anything that's strong in your mind at the moment, perhaps you can just park that and come back to it later. And just have that intention of bringing your awareness more particularly to this present moment. So perhaps it helps with that just to Bring your attention more particularly to your breath. And just be interested to notice what it feels like to be breathing in and breathing out. Just a gentle curiosity. And what you might notice is that each time you breathe out, the breath just tends to taper away. It's longer finer, subtler. And then there's often a little pause before you breathe in again. So aim to let go of any effort to actually breathe in again. Just allow the breath to come back in of its own accord. Quite effortlessly. Effortlessly. And as you continue to hold your attention on the breath, you might notice too there's just a natural tendency to let go a little with the out breath. Breathe out. Don't need to make any more or less of it. There's just a natural tendency to relax, release a little, let go a little with the out breath. So breathing out. The out-breath going longer, finer, subtler, just tapering away. Gentle feeling of letting go a little. Pause. And just allowing the in-breath to come back of and of its own accord. And just feeling the ease of it all natural ease of it all. So 
almost like you're just flowing with the breath, just going with it. Then you might like to take your attention up to that point between the eyes, a little into the forehead, and you might notice there what's like a still, quiet centre, point of stillness. Maybe you notice that point of stillness a bit more particularly behind the, cl- behind the closed eyelids. Point of stillness. It's almost, almost like you can move into that stillness, like a merging, melting, coming together. Sometimes it can feel like you're expanding out into the stillness going with it, going with it. More and more. Deeper, deeper, just simply letting go. Letting go and just resting quietly for a few moments. Effortlessly. Letting go. That's good, good, good. When you're ready now, just let your eyes gently open again. Sort of feels like it mightn't have been a good idea to take up all my time with that, but (laughs) Uh, I'm just curious. In that little exercise we just did, how many of you got some sense of that stillness that I was talking about? Quite a few. Because that that really highlights one of the main useful points to be aware of in meditation, and that is that our mind actually has two aspects. And I think many people are quite familiar with one, but not so familiar and certainly not so connected to the other. So so the first aspect of the mind we could call the active mind, and that's the domain of our thoughts, both conscious and unconscious, and our emotions. And, And the other is this still mind, which is beyond all that activity of the uh, thoughts and the emotions. And if we just examine the two a little, look into them a little, the, the active mind, we could say, is the domain of the individual. We talk about my mind, my thoughts, my emotions. And, and it gives us this very strong um, sense of individuality. Uh, and it's quite dualistic. So it's like, I'm here and you're there. I'm the centre of the universe and everything else is going on around about me. 
but at the same time internally there's lots of thoughts going on and emotions and they're changing all the time and they can have very differing effects. Uh, sometimes they can uh, work for good, uh, sometimes they can be downright dangerous. And uh, John Milne summed it up really well in Paradise Lost, where he said, mind is its own place. That's interesting enough in itself. But he said, mind is its own place and of itself can create a heaven of hell or a hell of heaven. So it's pretty clear with our mind we can uh, do all sorts of interesting things. It could be good, it could be bad, and understanding something of that active mind helps to explain the wide range of human expression and emotions we feel. So by contrast, the uh, still mind, we could say is the domain of the transcendent. Uh, it's beyond all these thoughts and emotions, and it's, it's really non-dualistic. Uh, it's a bit hard to define, and it's been called by many names, but it's said it's beyond words, uh, beyond description, unborn, unceasing, the very essence of space. Yet it can be experienced as the pure wisdom of our own awareness. So with the active mind, thoughts and emotions, some people in the West, sorry, in the East, refer that to that as the monkey mind, jumping around from one thing to another. Uh, we could call it the ego mind. Some people just politely call it the intellect. Uh, the still mind is known by many names. Uh, we could call it the transcendent mind. Uh, some call it Samadhi, Nirvana, Buddha mind, God, uh, Allah, Yahweh. Uh, it comes by many names, Brahma. Uh, in Tibet, the active mind is called Sem, S-E-M. And uh, the uh, still mind is referred to as Rigpa. And again, it's hard to define these things clearly. Um, but Rigpa's got a lot to do with our original unaltered state of consciousness. And you could also say that the active mind is to do with how we appear to be and the still mind is to do with more to do with how we really are. And the still mind, the, a good analogy for these two aspects of the mind is the blue sky and white clouds. It's one of the reasons I called my recent meditation book Blue Sky Mind. So the blue sky is like the still mind. It's pristine, vast, pure, doesn't get stained. And the clouds are like our thoughts and emotions. They come and go all the time. They change all the time. Sometimes they're really pretty. They can be useful when it rains. Uh, and sometimes they can be downright ugly and, uh, you know, we've dealing with a lot of consequence of clouds in Australia at the moment with all the flooding. So they're a real mixed bag. Uh, coming back to the still mind again, it's, it doesn't change. It's a constant. And, and its nature is unchanging. And it's all to do with having clarity, um, being at peace, being connected, it's to do with wisdom um, and uh, compassion. So you could well ask, why don't we just focus on the still mind <laughs> and do what we can to forget about the active mind? Well, the point is, the active mind, while it makes a pretty poor master, is a great servant. And it would be very hard to function, actually, uh, without an active mind to help us to make the choices and decisions that we do. So this is where personal kindness comes in. And if we're interested in actually um, our own welfare and well-being, 
then it behoves us well to take an interest in both our active mind and, and the still mind. So, um, it's interesting to notice what our active mind does to us. So if I can just speak personally for a moment. Uh, I've got a broken nose. <laughs> I've got one leg. Uh, I wear a caftan because uh, it's more comfortable than um, wearing pants with one leg. And so when I go down the street, I get quite a few people uh, looking at me. And uh, I wouldn't mind betting there's a few projections involved. So I'm thinking about that, and then I'm thinking about, well, you know, I come from an English heritage, so does that mean I'm an emotional and am I, I'm emotional enough? And, and I look at my dear Italian friends, and they've got emotions spilling out everywhere, and I think, God, should I be more like that? And then I'm thinking, well, gosh, maybe I'm spending too much time wondering about whether my beloved AFL team, Melbourne, is going to win the premiership again in, 19, in 2023. Um, and then I'm thinking about, well, gosh, all this spiritual practice I've done, I'm not enlightened yet. <laughs> oh, dear. <laughs> so this is what our active mind does for it, isn't it? It's sort of um, it's doing all this stuff constantly. We're listening to others, trying to gauge what opinion they've got of us. It's got this internal dialogue sort of raging. We take it all pretty seriously if we're not careful. Uh, and all this leads to a wide range of mental states. So the point again is that the still mind's beyond all that. And so in one way we could say having some experience of this still mind gives us an internal refuge. It's a sort of place to go to where we can get away from all that sort of activity, both good and bad, but you know, all that stuff that's going on and find a place of peace and contentment that's totally reliable and ever-present. It's not like we have to create it, it's there all the time. We just have to actually find a way to connect with it. So if we take personal kindness into our meditation, we pay attention to both aspects of the mind. Um, and with the active mind, what our intention there is, is just to help it to settle. It's a bit like if you've got a glass of muddy water and the, and the water's like your still mind, the mud's like the thoughts and you keep your finger in the glass of muddy water and you keep agitating and just get more and more muddy water. But if you put the glass aside and just let it settle, then the mud settles and you've got the clarity of your mind uh, just there quite naturally. So with that in mind, um, many of you will have noticed, I suspect, when you started to meditate, that you become more aware. And one of the first things we tend to become aware of is that there's just a lot going on. <laughs> there's a lot of thoughts, there's a lot of emotions, and some of them aren't all that pretty, and it can be a bit disconcerting. So again, we just have to take some personal kindness to this and to understand. It's a bit like if you've got a dark pair of dirty socks. When you take them off, they don't look too bad, but you stick them in water and wash them a little, and all this dirt comes out, and you think, my God. <laughs> so we just have to be patient and realise that as we meditate and we become more aware, we see things more clearly, and from that position, we're able to actually start to regulate what's actually going on with our mind. So, this is where I've lost my place. <laughs> Here we go. <laughs> I'm, I'm going to finish up soon. Um, so, at the, but at the heart of the meditation is this uh, stillness. So if we're really wanting to define meditation in this sort of context, to me it's a process that takes us from our common deep engagement with our active mind into a more direct experience of our still mind. And when it comes to do th doing this, 
there are many, many techniques, many possibilities. So what I would encourage you to do, which I'm sure you're doing, is, is to be discriminatory. It makes sense to experiment with a few things, but then it makes sense to actually fixate, you know, get, get into what really uh, seems to be working best for you. And just one final point to make that's really crystal clear with that when it comes to meditation practice. It seems unfortunately true that if you want the benefit, you have to do the practice. <laughs> I know that might sound like a bit of a mystery, but there, there does seem to be pretty good evidence that if people meditate on your behalf, pray for you, things like that, you'll get some benefit. And I would always encourage your friends and relatives to do that for you. But the evidence is pretty strong. The more you meditate, the more benefits you'll get, both therapeutically, well-being, spiritually, the whole thing. So the, this introduces the uneasy question of discipline. Because I think in Australia we rather pride ourselves on being anti-disciplinarian. But we don't want to get confused here, actually, because the discipline we're talking about here is a personal kindness. I think it's a really good way to understand this self-discipline as a personal kindness. It's about recognising what's good for you and doing more of that. So I, I would really encourage you in your practice. Uh, I think it's... If we think about what might help the future of the planet, I reckon making meditation compulsory at every level of education. <laughs> you know, people argue about religious instruction, people argue about sexual, um, what do you call it, education. <laughs> uh, I, I think if we had uh, meditation as a compulsory subject that ran through education from primary school right through to tertiary level, uh, it would be wonderful. Uh, and I think increasingly we're seeing that. So I'd encourage you in your own practice and I'd encourage you to do what you can to help other people to practice. Thank you.